Anybody here happen to be from Korea? Are you born there? Yeah. Are you from Seoul? Yeah. Ah, you may know about this. Okay. <clears throat> so, there's a, there's a, do you know about the oldest tree in Seoul? <laughs> so this is uh, the oldest tree in Seoul. It's a ginkgo tree. Uh, and it's supposed to be 840 years old. That's a really old tree. And it's venerated by the residents. It's kind of a, a, a holy, a, a sacred tree. And they bring fruit, they bring other offerings once a year, and pray, <laughs> among other things, for their safety. But its real advantage is <coughs> that it helps pregnant women to have a boy child. And so this is a very important tree. And so do, do you know about this tree? No. Not Yes, okay. Ginkgo is one of the few kinds of trees that has male and female sex. Most trees are hermaphrodite, have both male and, and female sex. Anyway, it turns out they ran into a problem with this tree because two apartment buildings were interfering with the tree's roots as, as the tree spread its roots. So what happened, so the district government spent $4.3 million to take down the apartment buildings. <laughs> so it just shows to show you the importance and the uh, political acceptability, the cultural acceptability of sun preference. It's a very, very big factor <coughs> in the world. The sex ratio is a very important biological factor. If we have time at the end, I'll, I'll tell you a good bit about it. But just to show you that it's very well controlled uh, biologically, this is one of several theories about how the sex ratio in humans gets to be what it is, that sperms are 50-50. There's, there's 100 male sperms to 100 uh, female sperms. And that's because <coughs> uh, the sex is determined by the father, and the father has one X and one Y. And when they split to go into separate sperms, one gets an X, one gets a Y. That's even. But by the second month of gestation, so this is still in the mother's room, apparently, a huge fraction of about one-third of the male fetuses are, have died, leaving, uh, um, I'm sorry, of the female fetuses have died, because now it's, it's a high male ratio. Then as time goes on, the female fetuses start to die, and when you end up, you get 106. At birth, all over the world, unless people are messing with it, there's about 106 male births to every 100 female births. This is a very, uh, very fixed number. So for instance, in the United States in 1969, there were 105.3 males born per 100 females. Uh, 1995, 30 something years later, uh, 104.9. So a difference of 0.4. That number really does not vary except basically between 105 and 100. And six. It's a very, very stable number. <coughs> okay, so given that, you can look at some parts of the world and see something like this. This is again the sex ratio, and you can look over time, 1972 to 1992, a 20 year span. And here's Japan, where they started a little bit of X. Here's, here's the numbers you should expect somewhere in this range. They have somewhat of an excess of boys, but very minor. And then during this period of time, Japan came down to almost exactly that 106 number. But look at what's going on in China. Up to 113 or so, which means basically seven out of every 100 girls were being done away with, 7%. And I'll show you that's not anywhere near the, the, the worst uh, case. So what do you think is, is uh, the cause of this? Mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA. Is that Brian no. Pike's book, The End of Men, that talks about how some for instance, mitochondrial DNA uh, can to eliminate the ah, So you think it's a very long-term evolutionary. What she's saying is she thinks there's, there's stuff that uh, uh, the, 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 the Y, the sperm, the y, the y chromosome has very few genes. The X chromosome has many genes. 
there looks like there's a long evolutionary process uh, by which genes are getting eliminated on the Y and eventually the Y will then have nothing on it and, and disappear. But this is much too short a time. We're talking 10 years. Evolution just doesn't happen in, in 10 years. But it's a good, good thought. Did that have to do with the implementation of the one-child policy? Okay. Very good. This is, this, this is the most usual answer, is the one-child policy in China. This is China, remember, and the one-child policy. So people have heard of the one-child policy, and we're going to give lectures on it. Does that sound like a good hypothesis for you? Yeah, but just saying it doesn't make it true. So what else? Th this is at birth. This is at birth. Very good uh, idea. What she says is, look, this is at birth. And wait, okay, you're getting ahead. We'll, we'll <coughs> good, I'm glad all this, this discussion. Let's notice one other thing. One child policy. When does the one child policy start? We'll come back to these, uh, these explanations. They're all good. Anybody know? Kisra, about 1979, 1980. When does this take off? <laughs> right? So that looks like now we've got at least a second uh, the piece of evidence that it, it, the time sequence fits very nicely with uh, the one child policy. So, how can we check that? We're still, you know, we have to be very skeptical about everything that anyone tells you. That's, that's a scientific attitude. Anything anybody tells you, politics, science, religion, economics, try to say something. Immediate gut responses, that's nonsense, prove it to me. So I'm not convinced yet. So what else might you do? If you could find data on, on abortions. You could find data on abortions, good. We'll, we'll look at that when we talk uh, about China. But we might look at other countries that don't have the one-child policy, right? So here's another country. This is India. And you have, remember the, the Chinese, uh, and, and this is a somewhat different data set. This is not, not at birth, but the total population, which is less extreme. <coughs> but a comparable number for China would be here. So India is more extreme than China. Yeah, India is a bad example because bride prices are so high that they similarly There are reasons, other reasons in India. There's clearly reasons all around, and they may be different in different places. But the, but the main hypothesis that we are working on, and, and come back to that, it's very important. The main hypothesis that we're working on is that it's one child policy in China. <coughs> but now we see that China is not particularly extreme, say, compared uh, to India. Depends what year you look and exactly what statistic you look. It's really in the same ballpark with India. So now we have to say that, well, it's probably not one child policy. So what's our next hypothesis? We've heard. We've heard a different one for China. Uh, India has bride price, but then if you start with India and say that, China doesn't have bride price. May have dowry, may have in fact the opposite. So what about? That's something, but, but why are the women doing? Poverty, that's the usual thing when you speak of India and China in these years. They were still very, I mean, they're, they're still quite poor, but it, it was poverty. So how does that strike you as a, as a hypothesis for this? <coughs> or part of it? I mean, no, th these things are multi-causal. China's economy has been taking off, but it's the ratios are still going up. Well, I only show, I'm going to show you that data, but I only showed you the data up to 1990, uh, 92. Uh, so I, I haven't, ha I'm going to show you that. Uh, OK, so again, we can go to an international comparison if we want to see if poverty is at the root of this. And what are we looking at here? Korea, South Korea. Korea is not a poor country, right? And yet they're just as bad, in fact, a little bit more extreme than China at this time. So uh, we really have a, 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 a quite a conundrum that we can give particular explanations for each place, but they're gonna, maybe going to be different. It could be population growth in general. That's certainly true of all uh, of the three 
countries, that there's something about the density of population, hard to prove since India and China has been very crowded for a very long time, and Korea is also crowded, but not as extremely as, as, as China uh, and India. Okay, so <coughs> not the, the greatest sex ratio is in South Korea, which as you've heard is not poor, and by 2010, there will be a 20% deficit in the marriage age, there'll be a 20% deficit of, of females in Korea, which is quite, uh, quite high, and that's done away with. So the, the, uh, the poverty thing, the economic thing, does not work between countries, and even if you look, I'll show you a little bit later, there's big regional variations within each, each country, uh, but it doesn't go with economics at all. So in China, uh, in Guangdong, Guangdong, which Canton, which everything, everything you're wearing and everything you play with, including probably this, is made in somewhere in Guangdong province, uh, probably. And so it's one of the richer places in China. And the sex ratio there is 130 to 100. Something I showed you, 12 to 14. In that province, it goes up to 130. And parts of that province, so of course, even within a province, there's, there's different places. They can go up to 144 to 100. So something like a third of the girls are done away with. No, bride, bride price doesn't happen in either China or India. Bride price, you remember, is when the man's family gives something to the girl or the girl's family. Dowry is the opposite. And dowry is, is common in, in India. And really, it's really <coughs> communists got rid of it. Any, any vestige of that in, in China. So that, that's not the case. <coughs> so in India, the same thing. Uh, the states uh, in New Delhi and Haryana, which are the richer places there, uh, have more extreme sex ratios than poor places. And uh, there's in, uh, in Delhi, there's 861 females per 1,000 uh, males uh, at, at birth. And so as time goes on, as you see, the sex ratios are getting uh, worse. And the, f the answer to our problem of what is, car is causing, what caused things to change at this point in time is what someone here said. What, what did someone say? Something that would have, wasn't the one, ch it is the one child policy happened at this time, but something else happened in both India and China and Korea. It has to do with technology. For, um, sex birth. For knowing the sex uh, before birth. And, and what, what is the technology that's commonly used? Ultrasound. ultrasound. That at that time, ultrasound came in and became uh, rather inexpensive and available. The two ways of doing it are amniocentesis, which is somewhat difficult medically and quite expensive, but ultrasound. You don't need an awful lot of training. The equipment is not terribly expensive. It costs, I think, about $14 in, in India at, in this period of time to get an ultrasound test of what your, uh, your, your fetus was. <coughs> so uh, in one of the counties in, in China, for instance, that they started doing ultrasound. And what happened was the first child, and I'll show you some data, uh, that was OK if it was a girl. But if, if they had a first girl and the second child was also a girl, then 92% of the time uh, the girls uh, would be aborted. And I think in your reading, it talks about in India, in uh, 8,000, they, they looked at 8,000 serial abortions in a particular hospital, and 7,999 were females. One was a male, and that, that was probably a mistake. They just read didn't read the ultrasound right, and it's not always easy to do it. So what's happening is that in India and, and in China, it's illegal in both places, but they have even sidewalk clinics that you can just go and, and, and get a little ultrasound. Says, how many of you have had some sort of ultrasound? Yeah, it's very, you know, they take a little probe about that long in this and just run it over you and get a picture on a TV screen and 
and, and you know whatever your heart or your lungs or your baby, whatever's going on. So uh, that's, that's, that's what's going on. It's the cheap ul ultrasound. Uh, doctors in a lot of places, doctors, it's so fast to do this, it's so cheap, it doesn't take much skill, that in a lot of places, doctors are just giving up all the rest of their practice and just doing ultrasound. It's, it's, it's sort of like liposuction here or something. It's, it's uh, easy, and, uh, easy and cheap, and, and they make a lot of women, a lot of uh, uh, money with this. <coughs> so the head of the Women's Association uh, in India says, no one wants girls. If the test says a girl, then the pregnant woman will have an abortion. Uh, and so someone else also mentioned this, I think, that the final sex ratio, uh, not at birth, as, as we said, one, the hint is one of you picked out, the fact that this is at birth means it's not an infanticide issue. This is something doing before birth. The only thing you can do before birth is sex selective abortion. So it's clearly the mechanism of this, and the timing is clearly the introduction of ultrasound. But the total sex ratio of, of the countries hasn't changed all that much. Then in China, we have pretty good data, and traditionally, wherever one has data, there has been a, a, a dearth of about 10 to 25 percent of girls from, well, they have data back to the 1700s, that's, that's pretty decent. But back then, it was infanticide. So what you're really seeing is a change of method that the, the society is going from an infanticide control of the sex ratio to an ultrasound and, uh, <coughs> and sex selective abortion control of the sex ratio. So the, apparently the desire and the, and the cultural desire for, for males hasn't changed all that much, but technology has, has changed what they do. And to most people's mind, uh, it's, uh, an abortion is, is, a, is a better thing than, than an infanticide, but uh, you can make up your own mind about that. So let me give you uh, some more data that of the various questions that, that you've all asked. Um, one is an update in time, so that particular slide uh, stopped in, in that particular data set stopped in 1992, and this picks up a little bit later. And here is, again, India, five states there, and in the most extreme states, which again are the richest, not the poorest, the poor, uh, this is a poor state, these are rich states, this is southern states. There are all, there's different reasons, we'll come to that in a moment. But here we saw ratios of, of one, uh, 114 or so, and now they've gone up to 129 and slowly getting better, a little bit better with time out to the last census in 2006 uh, data. And these are two uh, well-off uh, provinces, and they're extreme. Southern India is, uh, they're, they're in the North India they speak Hindi, mostly Hindi-related languages, in the South Dravidian-related languages. Uh, the Muslim invasions didn't quite reach the South of India. A lot of differences between North and South India. In terms of demography or culture, almost anything, it's, it's crazy to talk about India. You cannot talk about India. It's so diverse. China, they've convinced the people that they're one culture, but in India, that's not the case. So you really have to compare this as one kind of, these two states as one kind of country, and this as very close to the, to the 106 level. So this is, and also just weirdly, in, in, uh, in most places, it's the number of boys, uh, to girls, but in India, the way they define sex ratio is the opposite. So I've translated into these. These are the numbers that are comparable to what, what you've been, been hearing. Okay, that's India. Here is China. Again, it has gone more extreme. So we stopped here about 1992 in the 112 range. And uh, this is at birth, age zero. So we're looking at this line that start, that's here, and that has now gone up to 118 or 119, the sex ratio at birth. And then as the child grows older, as, as the set of children that you're counting grows older, the sex ratio gets more and more uh, skewed as time goes on. And we'll look at, at that in, in a little bit. Uh, 
It is uh, very diverse. I, I mentioned this already. Very diverse by province. Here again is India. So Kerala, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, they're very poor. Kerala is a very poor state in India, one of the poorest. But they had a communist government for a long time and, and very they had a, a matriarchal, their traditional system was matri not matriarchal, matrilineal. So women have more power. For a lot of reasons, uh, Kerala has been doing very good on social indicators of social progress. And look at its, this is child mortality from zero to five uh, through the first five years here. And males, six, uh, six per thousand uh, male death, 4.5 females. Very low deaths. Compare that to Bihar, a very poor state, where 50 or 60 up to 70 uh, almost <coughs> deaths. It's a factor of, of, of 10 or 15 for females, the difference between uh, different states in India. And the same thing uh, in China. Here is, uh, sorry, why did I, ah, what I, wa what I wanted to show you about that s slide was, well, forget it for a moment. This is China, and you have, again, very different. This is sex ratio at, at birth, SRB sex ratio at birth, and over different periods of time, 1982, 90, and so forth. Notice in between the green, which is uh, a normal ratio, even biased toward females, this is almost within the normal range. This would be biased toward females, and uh, Tibet, the far western provinces, uh, are, are, are either normal or even biased toward females. And that is a, a, a cultural difference, because you have these are Muslim provinces, and the Quran forbids uh, the killing of daughters. So Muslim countries in general do not have uh, this, these very skewed uh, sex ratios. Tibet, of course, is, is Buddhist, and they also don't do this. But in the Han regions, the heartland of China, especially around 2000, 2005, you know, very high ratios, 120 to 138, and change, changing a little bit slowly. So as time goes on, we see they go from uh, the 112 that we talked about, the blue regions, they are being disappearing, and you're getting more extreme uh, situation here in China. So again, you can pick out, depending on, if, if, if you look at, re at, at more culturally homogeneous regions, you get either very low numbers, or very uh, high numbers. Uh, now, here's another thing which uh, I mentioned. It depends terribly much on parity, how many children they already have. So for a first birth, uh, this is, is China, and the going out to the year 2000. And this is the diff this is so, uh, parity here, and this is uh, the different censuses. So the latest census. 2005, I think, is this census here. And for first birth, it's, it's 107. It's pretty normal, a little bit elevated. But by second birth, it goes enormously up. And you're into like 140, or a, a prior census, 150. So a 50% difference in boys and girls. And that ex extreme there is the one-child policy is, is pushing that, because they're only allowed We'll talk a lot about that, and this is not really true anymore, but the, in, in principle, they're allowed only one child, so you get these very s high ratios here. And then by three children, four or five children, uh, the, the sex ratio is, is, is enormous. <coughs> and you may sort of have a little thing in your mind, wait a minute, one child policy, and here they have one child, they're having two child, they're having three children, they're having four children, they're having five children. You know, what's going on? And we're going to talk about that. So here is, and again, you don't want to, you don't want to nail this too hard to the one child policy, uh, because here is uh, South Korea, and uh, again, this is an old time, but uh, look what it goes up to, the same thing. So you look at the most recent numbers on this graph, and for first birth, it's a quite a normal ratio. Second birth, it gets bigger. By third birth, it's bigger than anything we see in China. And by fourth birth, 
It's way, way over, 237. We saw, what, about 160 or something in China, whatever, on the previous slide. So again, Korea, no one-child policy, no government control of fertility at all, and yet they are more extreme uh, than China. Um, at birth, um, at birth, the, the genetic factor, so uh, boys have an X and Y chromosome and girls have two Xs. Humans, as well as every other animal, carry a lot of deleterious or even lethal mutations, but you have them on only one chromosome. The other chromosome, will have a no in general, will have a normal copy of the gene, and for almost every gene, one normal chromosome makes enough of the proper protein and, and you're alive, you're fine. You don't even <laughs> notice that you've got this deleterious mutation there. So it's only when you get a mutation from both parents that it becomes what you can see, homozygous. You're getting the dele a, bad, a deleterious mutation from both parents. Then the person is sick. That works for all the chromosomes except for the sex chromosome. So a female has two X's, so this still holds for her. She's got to be really unlucky and get bad copies from both mother and father. But a male has one X and the Y with almost nothing on it, so if he gets a bad X, he's sick. So males are weaker. And one of the, the thoughts about why 106 males are born for every 100 females is that as time goes on, those males die uh, during childhood because they are genetically weaker, and eventually it evens out to 100, 100. And there's good evolutionary reasons why evolution pushes a, a, a sexually reproducing species to 100 males and 100 females. And we can go into that later, perhaps. So you're seeing that this is at, at birth, right around birth, which is still uh, genetic reasons. And this is all of India. You see that now the male deaths are higher than the females. This is a sign of the genetic weakness of males uh, at birth. And when you break that down by state, every single state uh, 54 to 40. There's more male deaths, 71 <coughs> to 68. So what do we have? Uh, one of the Punjab, which had uh, a high pro-male ratio, but at birth there's more male death than female death. So that's a, that's a biological uh, phenomenon <coughs> that continues. But if you look uh, later to child mortality, now we're, we're, we're done with, with the birth mortality, we're done with sex-selective abortion, that the sex-selective abortion itself uh, changes the sex ratio, but then even after that, the sex ratio keeps changing. So here again is in the first five years after birth, and notice again in Kerala, where they don't have this sex-selective, uh, this sex choice, and I've showed you this, uh, more males die than females. That's again the normal biological issue. But in every other state, females are, this is two and a half times as much, this is four, four times as much female mortality, uh, one and a half times as much, more than twice as much, twice as much, uh, half again as much. Then in all the states of India, with the exception of Kerala, there's an excess female mortality after birth. That's counter-biological. And what that is is basically some infanticide, but largely female neglect. They get less food, they get less good food, they get sick, they get taken to the doctor less often. Uh, if medicines are required, they, they don't get it very well. So you see this after birth reduction in females <coughs> uh, also. It, the, the problem just keeps keeps happening. So this issue of the, the loss of females in a population is a very large phenomenon. Statistics, well, from this data you can make fairly decent statistics uh, for places where this is collected. So in India alone, there's supposed to be something like 23 million women uh, missing. So add all this up and you, and you in the world, the, the somewhere between an estimate and a guesstimate is 100 million uh, missing women. And you could say 
you know, when you look deeper, more deeply for the reason, we've ha we have the sort of the proximate cause. People are using uh, uh, sex-selective abortion, but we haven't touched uh, much on the question of why uh, do they want to do that. And you can just say it's traditional, and, and I hear a lot of discussions that say that, and this is true. In India's first national census, which is 1871, there were 98 uh, million males, but only 91 and a half million females. Already 6% of the females uh, were missing. <coughs> Whereas in an, a population which doesn't discriminate against females, males being weaker all during the ages, there get to be more and more females. And at the older ages, extreme uh, excess uh, of females. But in India, already in 1871, there was quite a, a difference. In China, this is a Chinese book of travels from the 19th uh, century. And someone, a uh, Chinese person, went to, India, went to England and observed things and came back and wrote a travel book uh, for the Chinese. And this is a quote from that. England is so short of inhabitants that the English rear, rear every child that is born. Even prostitutes who bear children do not destroy them. So uh, England was you know, the dominant power of the world, and uh, they, were, they were invading uh, China with the opium war. So of course, everybody, including the emperor, was interested in what is England like, how come they're so powerful, what's different there. And th so the emperor read this, and the emperor's response was, he didn't believe that the English were so stupid. <laughs> so again, the cultural thing that, that you know, to, to raise up all the children, and especially to raise up all the girls, is just uh, not going. Uh, in your reading packet, it discusses uh, villages in India dating back to 1830 that have no girls at all. They just do away uh, with all the girls. All of them are, are killed. 1921, uh, Somerset Maugham, does that ring name, in, name ring any bells? Uh, uh, he was a famous author, wrote a lot of novels, a lot of movies with very famous uh, movie stars. Very popular author. 1921, he was touring China, and he came upon a little tower uh, on a Chinese hillside with a single small hole in the wall. So he's, he's, they're walking along, and there's a small tower, a little hole in the wall. And out of that hole came a <coughs> nauseating odor. And uh, he asked, he was with a, a, a Chinese guide, and he asked, well, you know, what is that? And you know, he thought maybe feces dumped there or something. No, it turns out it was a baby tower. And it was just a pit dug into the ground and surrounded with this tower. And people brought excess girls especially, but some occasionally boys, and just dumped them into this. <coughs> and a little boy came up and, and explained this to him and said that the little boy said that four babies were thrown in at that, that morning. This, doesn't, this particular passage didn't discuss the sex of the babies because he didn't know that. <laughs> they're, they're already in there. Uh, and <coughs> one of the quotes is, the female child is regarded as a liability here. In rural areas, women are not even considered people. And you'll do some reading where, uh, rather biased reading but accurate on this, that uh, you know, girls often don't get names, and traditionally they're named daughter number one, daughter number two, daughter number three, and all kinds of, of things. So as I've mentioned, the elimination of females is not limited uh, to the young. And uh, in one of your readings, or, uh, or I guess I described it to you, uh, the tribe in New Guinea, where uh, if a male died, his widow was immediately strangled. Do you remember that? That changes the sex ratio. Uh, in India, you've all heard about this, there, there used to be a, a variant of this practice called sati. You, you heard of sati or sati sometimes, where the wife throws herself on the funeral pyre of, of the man, or in some other way does away with herself. So this is from 1813, quite some time back, and there's a British captain named Camp who's eyewitness to one of these things, and he wrote uh, a description of it. Visvanatha, a male, had been sick a short time. An astrologer said that he was on the point of death, and so he was taken down to the side of the Holy Ganges River to expire. He was immersed to his waist in the river for some time, but he didn't die. They brought him back to the, ba to the bank of the river and let him broil in the sun. Didn't die. Then they put him back in the river again. He didn't die. He's returned to the bank. This kept going for 36 hours, alternate sort of freezing and baking, and finally this sick guy uh, died. Whether he would or would not have died anyway, 
uh, who knows, the, it was the astrologer's word that, that he was going to die. His wife, he was married, was a healthy young girl of about 16. Learning of her husband's death, she decided to be buried alive with his corpse. The British officer, this Kemp, tried in vain to persuade the girl not to do it, then tried to persuade the mother. Uh, and he said that, that a resolution of this type to just kill yourself was a kind of madness. But he had no success, and he encountered not the slightest sign of either hesitation or regret, regret on either the girl's part or the, the mother's part. So the actual scene takes place. The young widow, accompanied by her friends, proceeded to the beach where his body lay. He was placed in a grave about six feet deep. The wife circled the grave seven times, calling out, Hail God! Hail God! The surrounding crowd echoed her chant, Hail God! Hail God! She climbed into the grave. The captain, this British guy, moved up to within a foot of the grave to see if at the last minute she showed any signs of reluctance, or whether her relatives showed any sign of, of horror. And if she showed reluctance, he might have jumped in and, and, and pulled her out. She placed herself in a sitting posture, as her husband had been placed, didn't lay him flat, but a sitting posture. Both faced north, so she was sitting behind his back. She embraced the corpse with her left hand and reclined her head on his shoulder. The British officer still saw no sign of regret on her part. The other plan, other hand, she placed over her head with her forefinger erect, which she moved in a circular direction. The watchers then started throwing earth on them uh, to start burying them. And, and then other men, as, as the earth was put in, they stamped on the earth to, to pack it down. But she continued circling her hand until her head was completely buried. And then she kept going for some time after that and finally stopped. The earth was piled on and stamped down, and it was two or three feet above the heads uh, of the entombed. No tear was shed by any of the relations. Eventually, the crowd dispersed, and the ritual lamentations and howling commenced, but without sorrow. So <coughs> this is a long time ago, and it's, uh, it's, it's certainly extremely rare now if it happens at all. There was one report of one woman in a village about 10 years ago who did it. And you know, this is illegal in India, so very hard to get any decent statistics on it. But very rarely it happens. And this woman who killed herself on her husband Pyre was considered a paragon of virtue and sort of like a saint because she was following the old uh, religious customs. And the village was very happy about it because they got a lot of tourists to come and revere this saint-like uh, lady and made a lot of money uh, off uh, the tourists, but it's very rare. Uh, uh, and of course, <coughs> this whole sex preference business is not in any sense limited to Asia. Hispanic women in Los Angeles were surveyed. They want 2.8 sons on average and 0.1 daughters, a factor of 28 difference. That's uh, in Kuwait, before the Gulf War, this is the 1991 war, I think, uh, Barbara Walters, who you all know, did a story on, on uh, gender roles in Kuwait. Yes, during the Gulf War, she was there. And she noted that women customarily walk about 10 feet uh, behind their husbands. And this is, uh, happens in a lot of places. And a strong sign of, of female deference and, and dependence that the husband walks without the wife, and the wife follows 10 feet behind. You've, you've heard uh, of that custom. So the war takes place, uh, uh, the, 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 the Iraqis get beaten, she comes back to Kuwait uh, to do another story after the war. And she was so pleased uh, because now the, the, the men walked behind the wives, that the women were walking in front. And so Barbara Walter, oh, this is wonderful progress, this is the American, you know, they're, they're catching on over there. And so she approached one of the women and said, and then the camera was rolling to catch this, you know, she's a TV personality. This is marvelous, says Barbara Walters. Can you tell the free world just what enabled women to achieve this reversal of roles? And the wo Kuwaiti woman said, landmines. <laughs> and so it wasn't a reversal at all. Uh, all right, I think you, you get uh, the idea of, of all of this. Um, 
We, the, there's deeper reasons. I mean, again, one way is to put it down to Asian tradition, and that's not really any kind of an explanation. Uh, we like to think that people are rational around the world and, and that there's some more, more fundamental reason for it. And a lot of the reasons that you all said, what are some of the extra reasons that I sort of pushed aside for the moment? One was dowry issues, and some of you said some other things. I don't but there's a whole lot of things, and the basic story is that uh, in certainly in India and also in traditional China, the girl is brought up by the parents, uh, gets married at quite a young age, and by young teenage, uh, they get married and get shipped off to the, f the, son the husband's family, where she works is then counted in that family, and has worked, usually worked very hard, and, and a servant, basically a servant in that family. So the family that raises her has the problem of, of uh, investing in that girl, putting a lot of money to raise that girl, then just as she's able to start working seriously and maybe return some labor, some serious labor, or some money to uh, the parents, she's gone and she works for some other family. And so this is economically a very bad thing, and the, the people call raising a girl is like watering someone else's garden. And then on top of that, when the dowry system is, ex is strong, which it is in India and going crazy, uh, then at marriage, they have to provide a lot of money, and this can go up to be like a year's income, uh, easily, to, 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 to get the girl married. And it's a great honor thing. If you have a daughter, you have to get her married, so you have to pay dowry, or your family's honor goes away. So uh, this idea that the, that the girl is, is, is just passed away as soon at the, uh, just at the time she can be of value to you, is kind of the rational actor theory of why there's all this female discrimination. Anything strike you unexplained about that? Why is it that it's the girl that, that goes away all the time? Why can't the man go away? This is, by the way, characteristic of human societies. I may have mentioned this to you uh, for time alone, the genetics shows when that males in a village are related. They've stayed there for, for hundreds of thousands of years, and females move, uh, move out. So exogamy. And where have you seen exogamy before? Among the chimpanzees, where the females go out. And so as far as we can tell, this is a vestige from our very original biological roots, where our reproductive system requires not that the males fight each other and the males disperse, but that the males stay together in a military uh, situation and the females uh, go out. And so it's this very basic form of, uh, you can call it chimpanzee social organization, that leads to that the females go out and therefore the females are of no value to the family that brings them up and therefore they're discriminated against. The men stay together and they have to have a, a protective, uh, uh, protect the village against violence. In some places, there's, a, there's a, a, a tr either a tribe or a caste, as you'll call it, in India, the Nayars, which are very military kind of caste. What happens, they get married very young, but then the man may or may not like spend one night with the wife, and then he goes off to the military, and meanwhile, the wife has all kinds of sexual relationships, and it's quite formalized, quite legal. They, the women live in one big house, they don't really recognize, it's, it's like the Na that you read about, it's, it's a female lineage society, and then upper class men are invited in to sleep with these women and, and produce babies for them, and then the men have 15 or 20 years of military service. Then they come home, and only really at that time do they pick up uh, the, the marriage. And so again, it's a very clear, in this particular cultural manifestation, it's a very clear thing that women are the reproducers, men are the military ones. And as in chimpanzees, sort of a communal sexuality that, that who's the biological father is not uh, particularly Im important. Okay. <coughs> now I want to uh, switch gears here in the, in the time we have left. And we're this whole lecture is about South Asia, and South Asia and, and, and East Asia are the, the centers of female disadvantage. But that doesn't go on in all of South Asia. As I've mentioned, in Muslim countries, that basically does not happen. So we're going to talk next about uh, uh, two places. Uh, one is Iowa, and the other I'll tell you in a, in a moment. And 
So Iowa is a rich place, right? What is Iowa rich from? Agriculture, corn. It's a very, very fertile uh, place. Well, let me go, go back a little bit. So I, I will tell you the country that I'm going to talk about. If I can find it. Oh. Again, we worry a lot and, and have induced some of the Asians to worry about the sex ratio that all these men won't get married. But remember, we're seeing sex ratio disturbances of, of 12 to 20 percent. And remember, in Europe, I showed you this slide, that a lot of places only 30 percent or 40 or 50 percent of people got married. So the marriage imbalance uh, is much, was much more severe in Europe for hundreds of years than it is now in Asia. So the marriage pattern and, and the social system in, in Europe uh, made for a more extreme situation than uh, the female disadvantage in Asia. OK, there's not a great slide, but this is Bangladesh. And what's interesting in Bangladesh is it sits, this is the Himalaya Mountains. And here is China, Nepal, Bangladesh over here, India over here. And this is blown up a little bit. And what you see is this is the, the Bay of Bengal here is that the Ganges River comes out of the Himalayas. The Himalayas stretch all, all across here. The, the Ganges comes out of the, the, the western Himalayas. The Brahmaputra comes out of the eastern Himalayas. Bangladesh has lots of water. And this is all delta. You see this stuff? This is all delta from as through geological time as the river wanders around. It, it puts down a, a delta out here. And this is what the delta actually looks like. There's a reading uh, that you have which says that the place is so good that people are trying to move out, move out onto this uh, land and try to farm on it. And then, of course, a monsoon comes or the river, the water rises and, and they're wiped out. You, you'll have a reading about that, but keep this picture in mind when you do that reading. So now let's, let's do the, the story on, on, on the agriculture. So uh, the people in Bangladesh are Bengalis, uh, of course. And the, the Bengalis are a large group that are split, actually, between Bangladesh and uh, eastern, uh, northeastern part, part of India, uh, which Calcutta is the capital. Dhaka is the capital in, in Bangladesh. And Calcutta uh, <coughs> is the capital of West Bengal, which is part of India. So partition split Bengalis into two groups. Uh, Bangladesh is a very homogeneous uh, country between Pakistan, India, and, and Bangladesh, the three ones of the old British Raj. 98% of them are Bengalis, so they speak the same language, have the same cultural tradition, and 88% uh, are, are Muslim. So unlike India, which you cannot talk about as a whole, you can really talk about Bangladesh as, as a whole. Bengal is a very rich part of the world. Uh, the Mughals who ruled from the 13th, so the Mughals were Muslim invaders from, apparently, I think, from Afghanistan, uh, conquered north, north India, north of, of that part, and they ruled it from the 13th century onward. And they called Bengal the paradise of, of nations. In the 16th century, when European traders came, they were ecstatic over Bengal's abundance and, and riches. Uh, so why was it so rich? And you have to, for that, I want to compare it to Iowa. The uh, size of Bangladesh is 56,000 square miles. Guess what the size of Iowa is? 56,000 square miles. So they're, they're very close to the same size. Both are very basically agricultural. Uh, Maytag makes washing machines, or used to, in, in, in Iowa. But they're very heavily agricultural. But Bangladesh has a much better climate uh, than Iowa. They grow three crops a year in Bangladesh. It's nice and warm uh, there all the time. But poor Iowa. Anybody from Iowa here? They can only grow one crop a year. They grow winter wheat some, but basically it's one crop a year. Bengal, they can grow three crops a year. Uh, Bangladesh has plenty of water. I, sh I showed you they, they got nothing but, <laughs> but water there, so they, they, never, they never have droughts. And uh, Iowa's not bad for that. It has the Mississippi River on one side and the Nebraska River on the other side. Uh, but inside Iowa, the rivers are all very small. So you go to the edges, there's rivers. But inside, not a huge amount of rivers. And they uh, sometimes have droughts there. Uh, 
both are fertile. Uh, Bangladesh is a low alluvial plain, so the way land gets naturally fertilized is water rush. Glaciers in the mountaintop grind the rock, and that glacier uh, flower, as it's called, gets into the river, dissolves somewhat in the river, and during flood season, it spreads all this silt over the farmland, and that silt, uh, the, the minerals in the rock, are the fertilizer. So Bangladesh has this, this uh, floods from the Himalayas that cover basically the whole country, and it gets its fertilizer for free, gets a lot of fertilizer, and it gets it all for free. So again, the agriculture is, is looking real good. Uh, but Iowa does not get this, except at the margins when the Mississippi uh, floods and sometimes the Nebraska floods. So the interior of the country, they have to go and buy fertilizer there. So by all these geographical kind of considerations and climatic kind of considerations, uh, Bangladesh should be much richer than Iowa. And you compare three crops a year to one crop, and you know, something like three times as rich. But Bangladesh's per capita income, it, Iowa's income is 17 times larger than, than Bangladesh's. And the difference is basically all population. Iowa's population is uh, 2.9 million. Bangladesh is now about 140 million. So it's like 40 times a difference. Bangladesh has 40 times as much population as, as Iowa. And compared to every other place in the world, here are a variety uh, of places. Uh, here's Bangladesh way, way out in front of everybody else. Netherlands is considered you know, of, of, of other places, the next <coughs> most common place. And it's also an agricultural place, but per both these have, they don't have big mountains or deserts or anything, so all of the Netherlands is basically fertile and all of Bangladesh is basically fertile. But look at the difference in, in population <coughs> density. <coughs> and everybody else is less than either of, of those two places. So, and as you know, uh, as I've just mentioned, the, the income in Bangladesh is distressingly poor. It's one of the poorest countries in, in the world. And the estimates are that its population may double before, if and when, stabilizing. So things are, it's going to be very hard to make things uh, better in Bangladesh. <coughs> well, going back, uh, Bangladesh had a stable population. They had a kind of uh, traditional birth, high, very high birth, very high death rate, so the population grew very slowly, if at all. But about 1880, uh, population started to take off. That's when the, the again, colonialism and whatnot, the, the death rate started to climb. And they started adding about three million people every decade. And so what do three million extra people do in, in a country the size of Iowa? Not, not tiny, but not especially big either. Well, there's some jungle, there was some jungle in Bangladesh, they cleared that and they started farming. But by the late 1930s, the jungle was just totally gone. No more jungle land. In 1938, uh, Biran Ganguly, uh, Bengali himself, wrote, quote, every inch of land that is fit for cultivation is already used. Every pathway or cattle track is pared down by farmers on either side until it barely leaves room for two people to pass each other on, on this narrow track. Uh, so what did people do as the population kept increasing? They started moving out onto these mud flats that I've shown you, which are very temporary. And the cyclones come in. Not only is there sort of normal flooding from, from the rivers, but the cyclones come in. And you start getting these enormous death tolls in a, in a period of time in, in Bangladesh uh, from climatic problems. But it was really, again, a population problem, just like the deserts that I told you about. People shouldn't be living on these flats where they're going to be wiped out uh, periodically. Uh, there was, uh, for a while, almost 100,000 deaths a year from storms, erosion, and flooding, from these kind of just, just considered deaths from climatic water stuff. And so it took about 60 years of the population increase from Bengal becoming one, uh, going from one of the rich places of, of the world not industrialized, but rich on their agricultural uh, produce, to what was standardly described as a basket case. And now all the focus is on Africa, but not so much longer ago, Bangladesh was considered just as, as a, in, in bad shape 
uh, as Africa is now. That we constantly on the news, stories of disaster in, in Bangladesh, and uh, you're supposed to cry at that and, and, and give money. Um, so Bangladesh was clearly one of those places that was caught in one of these Malthusian traps. The arable land, and this is a somewhat old figure and the population has increased a lot, is 0.1 hectare per person. That's a quarter of an acre uh, of person. Just to compare you that, I, how m any of you from farm places? How many of you from farm places? Oh, every year I always get, get some. Do you know what, you're, what's the size of the, of the farms where you live? Where do you live? Outside of Cleveland, yes. okay, the, that's not one of the big farms. But do you know roughly the size of the farms? Do you know? No. Thirty acres. Thirty acres. Okay, so that's small. That's small farms. Out, out west, they can be thousands, like the real commercial farms of thousands of acres. And here's 0.1 hectare for a person. Here, in I used to live in Bethany, which is sort of a northwest suburb of New Haven, and our house was our part of Bethany was zoned for three acres. And I didn't have to live off it. I just, there was just a house on that. If you had a house, you had to have three acres. So that was enough to that in Bengal, in Bengal Bangladesh, 30 families would live on this three acres at, at, at 0.1 hectare per person. So all of the indicators in, the, in this time, starting, say, in the 1950s or 60s, uh, was that uh, Bangladesh would not be a country in which you'd, where you'd find a, a d desire to limit fertility or the practice of fertility limitation. It's, it's, it's as I've said, almost all Muslim, and it's a conservative uh, version of, of Islam there. Infant and child mortality was high. 25% of the children died before the age of five. But that had been coming down slowly, as I showed you, for, for roughly 20 years. Women had very low social status there. Most of them in, uh, were subject to purda, uh, which they not only have to, to dress so they can't be seen when they're outside of the house, but they generally couldn't go outside of the house at all unless accompanied by a male member of the family. And uh, men were fairly free to, uh, to abuse women, and I, I read you the, the first lecture, I think, some case of the battery acid being thrown at women in more recent times, so that, uh, that still continues. <coughs> Last time I mentioned that one of the reasons that people want children is for old age security. Who's going to take care of me in my old age? And of course, Bangladesh was very poor, had no social security system. So the families were, of course, dependent on uh, children for the old age. They were dependent on sons for their old age. So that means you had to have a lot of children to make sure that you can't have a daughter. You've got to have sons to make sure that you have somebody to take care of you. During the period of time I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, here are some of the major disasters uh, in, in Bangladesh over time. So this is one really very famous one, the Bengal famine of 1943. World War, uh, they, were already, they were already on the edge, and then World War II hits, and a variety of things happen, and uh, two, uh, two and a half million people, this is in two and a half million people die in, in the famine. Uh, Here's some of the cyclones, various cyclones. They had a war when they, they were trying to get independent of, of West Pakistan. They had a war, and <coughs> these things happened. Another cyclone, floods, all, all around. So all kinds of uh, problems beset the country. Now here, during this period, uh, that, that is the critical period for population issues, uh, the per capita GNP, the gross domestic product, basically didn't change, a little bit up but not, not enormously up. It's basically had a flat per capita e economy, per capita GDP. So again, the, the total economy was growing, but more and more people ate it all up. So basically, the per capita GDP uh, doesn't change in this period. Uh, but uh, what happened was that uh, Malthus had been in India, and, and the, India, the whole Indian subcontinent paid a lot of attention to Malthus. So they have been aware, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, have been aware of population issues and aware of the Malthusian ideas about it for a long time. And the British, of course, trained their civil servants 
of the countries. When they got independence, it was the same people. So this was in their mind. So in fact, the South Asia, originally India and Pakistan, were some of the very first countries to institute family uh, planning programs. And then after the one in Pakistan was not particularly successful, the one in India d is now much better, but did not start out successfully. But after the War of Independence, when Bangladesh split from West uh, Pakistan, the government really was aware of these problems, had a Malthusian attitude, and they really decided that they must start to get some control of their, of their population. So they, the government supported and instituted family planning program for the whole country, and international organizations said, okay, you want to do this, we will help you. And especially there's a, a group called the International Diarrheal Research Organization, which was one of the ones that had uh, discovered and, and, and pushed the oral rehydration packets. You know, many, many, huge numbers of infant deaths in poor countries do they get diarrhea. And diarrhea, the bug doesn't kill you, but you lose enough water through the diarrhea that you die basically of dehydration. And all you need to do is to have a little packet, uh, water, salt, and sugar. And uh, as long as the water is not terribly polluted, uh, the, the child will stay alive and eventually kick out uh, the virus or the bacterium. So this International Di Diarrheal Research Group, very well respected, and they said, okay, we will also, we will also help you uh, with family planning programs. And uh, what resulted uh, was a, a countrywide uh, program. Now at this same time, we're talking the early 1970s, most of the developed world uh, had the idea that they, what they see, they saw rich countries uh, have few children, poor countries have a lot of children. What's the cause? Well, money is the cause. When you get rich, you want to have fewer children. We're going to have a lecture on that very interesting phenomenon. So the developing a lot of developing countries and East European countries rejected the whole idea of family planning as a way of improving the economy and said, no, development is the best contraceptive. That was, that was the rule. Development is the best contraceptive. That there's no way in a poor place like Bangladesh that you're going to get fertility down because of all these reasons that, that we've mentioned. But if you develop the country economically, then it will naturally come down and the government doesn't have to mess with it, doesn't have to set up family planning programs. So everybody predicted strenuously that Bangladesh could do what it wanted with family planning programs until and unless they developed economically, there would be uh, no, no progress. Um, so what they did, um, was they, they, prior to this program, they had tried a variety of things. In Pakistan, one of the problems was, well, people are culturally into having a lot of children, and so we must work with their culture and must work with traditional birth attendants. So in Pakistan, including Bangladesh at, at the time, uh, they had uh, women called dais, who were basically um, local health providers, herbal women, uh, Mid midwives for births and, 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 and stuff like that. But they had basically no, no modern training uh, whatsoever. So in the first implementation of Pakistan's program, uh, they, uh, they gave these uh, dais various forms of birth control, and they were supposed to, to give them out. It didn't work. Why didn't work? The dais themselves were older women in general who did not use contraception themselves, did not think it was moral, did not think it worked. Uh, and had all kinds of bad attitudes toward it. So if someone tries to sell you something and they don't themselves believe in it, you generally don't, don't accept it. Uh, plus, economically, they made very little by distributing uh, these kind of contraceptives from the government, but they could make quite a bit more uh, by, um, by attending the births, that, that they charge a good bit for births, where the government set the little bit, they wanted to have the contraceptives very, fairly free to the people so they didn't pay the dais very much. So the dais would get all the condoms especially and sort of bury them somewhere and claim to the government that they had distributed them and then made a lot of, not a lot of money, but uh, their money from attending the births that, that hadn't been averted by this. So, so it didn't work. But they, you learn. I mean, these were, again, the first countries in the world to have family planning programs. They didn't know how to do it. You have to, you not given that this is the way you do it. So eventually they, they started the program that I described to you uh, somewhat last time. Um, 
where the women can't come out of the house, so you hire a, st a high status woman from that village, known to the women, has high status, uh, is herself using contraception, thinks it's a wonderful thing. You train her how to deal not only with the woman, but the woman has very little power there to deal with the husband, to deal especially with the mother-in-law. And for that, you need a high status woman that can go into a house and start discussing these things, because even talking about anything to do with sex or reproduction is not, uh, is not a socially uh, acceptable uh, thing. So they started this program, and uh, initially, you got this kind of a, a thing, and, and uh, Vina Siddharth talked about this, that when you start a family planning program, this is the, an old, older version of the family planning program, not, not the one I've just described. What you see is they, they took, uh, there was a place called Matlab, one of the districts in, uh, in Bangladesh, and they chose some villages, they wanted to know whether what they were doing was successful, some villages they gave this family planning program to, and other villages they didn't as a, as a control region. And here is during this period up to 1977, the comparison area where they didn't do anything special. The government had a small program, but nothing much was happening. Now the International Diarrheal Research Group comes in with this a somewhat updated program, not, not the, 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 the one I, I showed you. And what happens immediately, there's great success, and they're jumping up and down okay. This is true. But then it peaks, and then over time it falls down. So what's happening here is a small fraction of the women, well, 20% tw is not terrible, but a small fraction of the women, before the program comes in, are, are want to limit their births. And you give them anything, they accept it immediately. That's this initial rise, and that's very standard for family planning programs, that you get an initial rise, and then it falls off. And over the long term, if you're evaluating the program here, you think it's wonderful, but if you're evaluating the program here, it's kind of worthless. And uh, <coughs> Vina was talking about that, that she comes out of this economic World Bank perspective, and they're very impressed with, with these periods of, of time. This is a program that, in retrospect, we would say really didn't work, although it helps a, a fair fraction uh, of the women. But then you put in the good program that I described to you, and now what happens, the later time, so we stopped, the previous graph stopped in 77, at, at this level, of contraceptive uh, ac acceptance, <coughs> that a program that didn't work. Then they start sending these village working women into the homes of the other women, and now you get another big rise, that this is now successful immediately, but now the, the success continues. Meanwhile, there's modernization and there's social diffusion that uh, these areas, the comparison areas, are actually intermixed uh, with the treatment areas, and they hear a lot about what's going on in there. And so for that reason and others, I'm not, we don't really have data to say why it rises, but even in the comparison area, it starts to rise. And in one of your readings about Taiwan, where you have a family playing, very similar kind of thing, it makes a big point that there they did have some data, that they had villages where they had a family planning program, and then as soon as this was heard about in the surrounding regions, people would come into the treatment region to get treatment, so the fertility goes down. This one of the factors behind this is certainly uh, diffusion of, of, of the uh, ideas of family planning. Uh, so this, this thing in, in, in Bangladesh has, has had terrible significance for what we believe about uh, family planning and programs and people's acceptance of it. Because up until this time, it was really dogma that you have to have economic development and you have to have some degree of literacy and you have to have some degree of, of women's uh, status uh, before people would want to limit their fertility. Then you go into Bangladesh with a, with a well-funded, well-thought-out, well-run program and it starts working. And now Bangladesh is uh, its fertility has kept falling, and it's in there with a lot of countries that are a lot richer than it. India is a lot richer, Egypt is a lot richer than Bangladesh, and they all now have come to more or less the same kind of fertility level. So it, 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 it now is no longer really believe, it's believed that 
women almost everywhere, in this case it must be the men, because the men and the mother-in-laws control the issue, really do want to reduce fertility. And if you give them the option, they will accept it. Along the way, um, other places have learned other lessons. So India next door uh, had a, a much stronger central uh, government uh, because of the Gandhi effect. Gandhi was such a national hero to all the ethnic groups in India. So the government was strong and, and Nehru was very strong and, and Nehru's daughter, Mrs. Gandhi, was very strong. And they were westernized and under the Malthusian influence and they decided that they need a family planning uh, program also. Actually, India was even before this. Uh, but again, they didn't know how to do it. And they decided to use incentives. That's what you know, economists keep telling us. Every time you take an economics course, people respond to incentives. And so they decided to use incentives to, to get people to take on uh, family planning. And there's a lot of debate uh, about this issue of incentives. And one part of it, one article I read about people in villages in Nepal, like the one that, that, that uh, Bina was in, pretty far. They have to take a whole day off from work to go down uh, to get a contraceptive, then they have to go back, and what kind can they get because they, they can't go this every, every month to get something new, and they, they can't take time off from their work or their chores. So it's a real major economic expense, not the contraceptive itself, but the time and effort needed. If they have to take a bus, that may be very expensive in their economy uh, to that. So part of the idea of, of uh, giving incentives is to just repay uh, the woman for her time and effort. And India had started out that way, but the program was not very well run. It wasn't, th they didn't have the big international help that Bangladesh had, and the program wasn't terribly well run, and so they sort of got frustrated at, at the results, and their population kept going, and it was a time in India way before this current boom that India is, is, has been going through and may or may not still be going through. Uh, and so the government got frustrated and, and the population grew and, and their, they saw their hopes, this, this window of opportunity that I was talking about for modernization, if the population gets too dense, that window may close. So the government got, uh, got desperate and started introducing some coercion. They, uh, some of it is, is incentive, like uh, transistor radios to the men, uh, to get the men to get sterilized. And uh, that was wonderful, but who got sterilized with the old men that, that weren't going to have children anyway, but they get a transistor radio or, or some money out of this. And the whole thing crashed, and, and it came entangled as in America, reproduction and, and politics. So the opposition uh, to the people didn't especially like it because it's changing their, their culture. And, uh, but the opposition took hold of it and blew up all the abuses. There were no question there were abuses. Blew up the abuses, the newspapers blared the abuses, and it became a very big political thing. And uh, the Congress party government fell uh, because of that. India has since sort of, they, then they went to a period where they sort of did nothing in family planning because it was in, in such bad favor. And now they've started up again and think things are going uh, a lot better. So. I think the, the, the story of this is that the idea, which was prevalent up till the Bangladesh experiment, that only rich countries are going to reduce their fertility, is just plain wrong. And now as the, as the fertility uh, transition goes through Asia, it's now amazing places, uh, very poor places, what, what's happening there. So Ceylon was one of the first countries in Asia to get down to replacement level. Kara, very poor, Ceylon is not a rich place. Uh, Kerala, one of the poorest provinces of India, is down at replacement level. Uh, all kinds of countries, <coughs> I, I, um, Thailand, Indonesia, all have really reduced their fertility at amazingly low levels of per capita income. So income is clearly important. One doesn't want to throw it out. It's, it's perfectly clear that <coughs> things are easier if you have more money and there's reasons why richer people have fewer children, which we'll go into but it is not a necessary prerequisite. Okay, we will see, oh, have a good vacation. Uh, enjoy, come back refreshed, and I will see you then. <laughs>